so central banks like government in general have become a lot more uh, have a lot more powerful over the over the years. I think a concentration of power is is always something you want to be careful of because you know I, I think of it this way. Uh, let's say that uh, would you want for there to be people who have like superpowers? Uh, let's say that you had someone who could travel faster than the speed of light, who could lift boulders and so forth. They could end up like Superman flying around and saving everyone, or they could end up as being some kind of villain that, that terrorizes everyone. Joseph, great to meet you. And thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So really excited to talk to you as you're actually working at the Federal Reserve in the past. And, you know, for our listeners and myself even, can you give us a bit of a background about uh, how you got into finance and what your role was over at the Fed? Yeah, so I actually took a pretty long path towards finance. I started out my career as a lawyer and I practiced law for a few years. And I, I figured that, you know, that really wasn't for me when I was in university. So in the, in the U.S., you kind of have to you know, you choose your field of study, but you don't actually know what the options are. So when I was like in college, I thought I wanted a career that would make good money and sound fancy. And so for me at that time, it was to be a lawyer. But what I realized was that the practice of law was actually quite different than what you see on TV. It's not nearly as exciting. Uh, it's really just sitting in the office and writing stuff basically the rest of your life. And that's not really so what I wanted to do. you're telling me it's not like suits in the show. No, it's not like suits. There's there's no Tom Cruise just shouting out in the courtroom and saving lives and all that. Uh, for the most part, it's really just drowning the other party with paperwork. And it's sitting in your office, uh, looking at 200 page documents, making sure there's no extra spaces and uh, doing that for, for a long time. So that's not really what I wanted to do with my life. I liked understanding how the world worked. I like thinking about stuff. I like things that were, I guess, I like solving puzzles. So for me, markets seemed something that was more interesting. So I graduated around the time of the great financial crisis, which at the time was what what it, what everyone was talking about. If you turn on the news, um, if you were you know just uh, anywhere really, all you could see was the Dow going up and down, S and P looking like the world is going to collapse. You got central banks doing all these interesting things like quantitative easing. And you have the governments of the world basically panicking. So, you know, I was looking at that and I was like, wow, this is so interesting. I have no idea what all these people are doing, but it seems like you could make a lot of money. And it seems something like something really interesting, kind of like a puzzle that changes every day. So I tried to transition from law uh, into working in finance, and that was simply impossible back in uh, 2008, 2009, simply because at that time, everyone was losing their job. So um, if you wanted to do something in finance, it was, real, it was a really tough time. But eventually, you know, I went back to school. I worked in a few related industries and made my way towards more market-oriented role, which, uh, as you know, is at the Federal Reserve. So I was a trader on the Federal Reserve's trading desk. And that was a really interesting experience. It was a really good place to learn uh, because when you're at the Fed on their trading desk, you're kind of at one of the centers of the of the markets. Um, when you're at the Fed, you are one, you are privy to lots of information. You have a very good, um, the Fed has connections, you know, relationships with a wide range of market participants, ranging from foreign central banks, uh, domestic banks, investment funds, and so forth. So when you're at the Fed, you can call those people and ask them for their thoughts on the markets. And they'll tell you pretty candidly because they know that you are part of the government and there's, there's uh, some confidentiality there. And of course, the Fed also has tremendous amounts of confidential data. So the Fed is a regulator. So you know, what happens with the markets, say the treasury markets or uh, the banking system and so forth, uh, the Fed collects a lot of data on that stuff. So when you're at the open markets desk, you have this qualitative intel, you have the hard data, so you can actually have a really good insight into how the world works. And of course, when bad things happen, ultimately it's the open markets desk that prints the money and goes and, and buys, uh, let's say does QE and buys treasuries or does emergency loans to foreign central banks through the FX swap lines and so forth. So you're at the center of it all. And I thought it was a really good place to learn, which I did. And eventually I actually collected all my thoughts and, and wrote a book on it, which is a uh, bestseller on Amazon, actually. So got it right uh, here. 
Big fan of the book. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thanks for that uh, overview. And when you're on FinTwit and you're listening to the financial news media, the Federal Reserve in most circles is kind of public enemy number one. And I don't know if that's rightly or wrongly, but you realize how nuanced everything is and how intertwined, you know, the treasury markets are, the stock market, and then even, you know, global economies are intertwined into what the Federal Reserve is doing. So taking a step back, why do central banks exist? So that's a really good question. And you're exactly right that central banks have a really bad reputation, which I think is not merited. So the institution of a central bank Uh, evolved in the U.S. and in many other countries, basically as a lender of last resort to the commercial banks. Mm -hmm. So once upon a time, we had all these, you know, different, we still do have all these different commercial banks, and sometimes they'd get in trouble. So everyone would ask for their money back at the same time, and the banks obviously would not have enough cash on hand to meet those withdrawals. And when that happened, uh, a bank would go into a classic panic, where uh, you would have to fire sell some of its assets to raise the cash to meet its deposits. Now, this is a problem because when you fire sell something, you know, you don't get good prices. And so when you fire sell something, asset prices decline, and then that actually hurts the, hurts the assets of everyone else. Uh, For example, um, if I'm a bank, everyone comes and asks my money back when they're running back at the same time, let's say I have a whole bunch of treasury securities, I fire sell them to raise cash uh, to, to meet my depositors. That pushes the prices of treasuries down. And that means other people, you know, maybe maybe people begin to think that these other guys, um, their assets are declining in value. Maybe my money is not safe holding in, in that bank and maybe I'll go you know, and I'll try to withdraw my money back again. So banking panics were actually a, a big problem in, in, in the US before the Fed and in many other countries as well. I think uh, this culminated in, in an episode and I believe it was 1907 when there's this big panic in the US, everyone was taking their money out of the banking system, banks were fire selling their assets, they didn't, and if they didn't have enough liquidity, uh, to raise cash, they would, you know, essentially have to close doors, right? Which is mm-hmm. a bad thing because maybe there's nothing wrong with the bank. It was just that there's a sudden panic. At a high level, banks obviously don't keep uh, enough cash in their vaults to meet all redemptions at, at the same time. At that time, you had the private sector, so J.P. Morgan, step up and basically uh, offer emergency loans to a lot of these banks to shore up confidence, so that the people would not continue to withdraw cash. Okay, so if you are someone who's trying to take cash out of a bank and the bank just tells you, you know, we don't have enough cash in here today, but come back tomorrow. And maybe that's true. Maybe the bank just doesn't have enough liquidity. But from a depositor perspective, you you panic, right? So um, that means you'll continue to ask for more money and maybe your friends will do the same thing and that makes the problem worse. So ultimately, sometimes banks have this liquidity problem where everyone asks for their money back at the same time, but they don't have enough cash in the vaults. Now, we were saved by JP Morgan back then, but then it came to the attention of the government that maybe it's not the, the best idea to, to be so reliant upon uh, the private sector for something like this. What if, for example, we had a central bank who could act as lender of last resort to all these commercial banks so that in the event when, when we have a panic, everyone is asking for their money back at the same time, these commercial banks then they can borrow from the central bank have enough cash on hand to meet these withdrawals. And once the panic is over, um, then they would be able to repay those loans. Again, it's it's a way to address panics, which from the bank's perspective is a liquidity problem. Okay. So that was the initial um, catalyst for central banking was we needed a lender of last resort to prevent uh, bank runs from affecting the banking sector in the U.S. and really hampering economic growth. Is that a fair summation? Well, it, I think you, so these, the, uh, so today our central banks have a mandate of, let's say, full employment and price stability. Uh, I don't think eventually it was like that. That's something that they began, eventually began to take on, but it was more mm-hmm. of a lender of last resort function. I guess you could think of it as financial stability, which as you, as you suggest, is closely related to things like uh, economic growth. So how did central banking evolve to the point where everybody you talk to on the street and you know of course on fintwit we're very we're we're paying attention to the fed a lot more than i think 
our parents used to. I don't remember my parents growing up and then worried about what interest rates are going to be. Uh, maybe they just weren't that sophisticated, but it seems like everybody is always talking about central banks now. So how has their mandate changed? And is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? They just seem to be so intertwined in everything around us. So central banks like government in general have become a lot more uh, have a lot more powerful over the over the years. So I'll give you an example. So in the U.S., um, the U.S. began as a as a country where we have uh, a very small government. Um, there was a time when the government was so weak that they they actually could not mandate seatbelts on cars because it simply wasn't their responsibility. So that's changed a lot, right? Now today. I, I think there are things that the federal government can do in the U.S., but I actually I don't really know uh, what those things are. So we've we've done a, a big big shift in, in the in the power of government, and that's the same thing for the central bank as well. Uh, initially, the central bank again lender of last resort to commercial banks, uh, but today the Fed is is much more than that. It's a lender of last resort to a lot of people, to the foreign central banks through the FX swap lines, uh, to the primary dealers through the uh, let's say the repo facility. Um, to the money market funds in emergencies. And if you remember what happened in 2020, it's also the lender of last resort to the corporate center where the Fed had a corporate credit facility that was essentially lending to the corporate sector. And so because the footprint of the central banks have become so much larger, they're so much more involved in the markets, um, what, what they think and what they do has a lot more influence. And so... Today, um, people watch the Fed a lot because what the Fed does has a tremendous impact on asset prices. So if the Fed, uh, if you look just say the past 10 years, a really easy strategy to make money in the markets would simply be to buy when the Fed is dovish and uh, sell when the Fed is hawkish, right? Because the Fed is, mm -hmm. is so dominant in, in, the, in these asset markets. Um, I'm not sure. So the Fed has always, always been um, an important part of the market, uh, but I'm not sure if it's ever been as dominant as it is today. And in your opinion, is that a is that a benefit or is that a risk that we're concentrating a lot of power in uh, an institution for asset prices, you know, locally and then across the globe as well? I think it's, it's concentration of power is, is always something you want to be careful of because, you know, I, I think of it this way. Uh, let's say that, uh, would you want for there to be people who have like superpowers. Uh, let's say that you had someone who could travel faster than the speed of light, who could lift boulders and so forth. They could end up like Superman flying around and saving everyone, or they could end up being some kind of villain that, that terrorizes everyone. So the concentration of power, you know, really depends on whose hand it's concentrated in. And sometimes it ends up in, in really bad hands. And what, what I'm seeing right now, though, is that it's increasingly being wielded for, for political purposes. I'll give you an example. So the Fed's mandate obviously is uh, full employment and price stability. But what we've increasingly seen is that there are more and more people who would like to use that power to do things like climate change, right? That's obviously not in the Fed's mandate. Uh, but then there are people who think that's really important and they try and you know make the Fed do, uh, use the Fed as a tool to do what they want. Now, that's something that's only possible because you have such a big concentration of power. Another example would be central bank digital currencies. Now, in other countries, you know, they've going full steam ahead, trying to implement this that will radically change the financial system. The Fed in its current leadership isn't fully on board with that. But you can easily imagine a scenario where uh, there's a change in personnel and then people start to use the Fed as a way to implement these political decisions. So I think it's not a good thing for any organization to have too much power, simply because sometimes that power ends up in, in, in the hands of people who don't build it competently. Yeah, and definitely want to get your thoughts on CBDCs later in the uh, conversation. But going back to the Federal Reserve's mandate of full employment and then price stability, and their target is around 2% inflation, I believe. What do you think has caused inflation rates globally to spike over the past couple of years. And what do you think those conversations are like in the Fed right now, knowing that they really only have one tool to sort of get prices back down to that 2% mandate? So at a high level, inflation is assessed when demand pushes against supply, right? So mm -hmm. I think what's happened over the past, let's say, 100 years or so is in line with what we were discussing. The government is more involved 
in the economy. Now, if you're a Fed and you have one tool, interest rates, to try to slow slow down economic growth, I think it makes sense in a world where the, the private sector is very large. Because let's say you and me, when we go and we do something, we care about interest rates. If the interest rates are too high, maybe we won't borrow as much, right? So the Fed's tools is useful to us. But if you're talking about the federal government, well, they're, they're not really interested in interest rates, right? Um, if they want to spend more money, they just print more treasuries. They are indifferent to interest rates. So if you have a, a government that continues to spend a lot of money, well, that can be inflationary regardless of what the Fed does, because obviously the government doesn't really care about, about interest rates. That's They're almost pressing big... on the brake pedal and the gas pedal at the same time, right? Yeah, I've yeah. I've seen so... that right now as fiscal mm -hmm. is going against monetary. So that's a big thing. and But there are also things that are in addition to that as well. So again, when demand pushes against supply, that's the demand side. So we have a lot of people, um, a lot of the government continues to spend indifferent from, from interest rates. We saw that mm -hmm. in a... You saw that very obviously in 2020, but the supply side matters as well. And what's happening on the supply side is that we have fewer and fewer workers. So um, in order to produce more goods and services, obviously we need more inputs. We need more people. Um, for all of history, we had big family. Okay, so for most of history, we had big families, big families. So the population continued to grow. So that means the workforce continues to increase. That continued to happen until the 1980s when we began to have smaller families. When we had smaller families, the workforce can no longer increase. An interesting fact is that since 2016, the working age population of the United States has basically been, been uh, stagnant, it hasn't really changed that much. It's been growing since the beginning of our country, uh, but since 2016, not that it's been basically the same level. So if your workforce population isn't growing, uh, you have to, you, it's hard for you to continue to grow. There's a shortage of labor, so to speak. And so that means that the price of labor has to go up wages. And that means uh, people have more purchasing power and, and that that can be inflationary. People can afford more things. Now, there are things that you can do to try to increase the supply of labor. First thing, of course, is immigration, which the U.S. has, has been doing, not as much as, say, Canada, but, but it's happening. And the second thing that, that you could do is that you could have a higher labor force participation rate. So what that means is that uh, you have a whole bunch of people who are outside of the labor force. Now um, uh, you're encouraging them to work with higher wages. And we saw that happen in 2021 as well. So a lot of the boomers, they, they took their early retirement. They left the labor force. Let's say there are one to two million uh, retirements that were earlier than expected. And what happened was that we had younger people, uh, basically, who were not looking for jobs begin to work because they uh, they were attracted by the higher wages. But you can't keep doing that, obviously. Uh, you, structurally speaking, uh, the labor participation rate has risen and is about a 1% below all-time highs. So uh, there, there's not that much, there's not that, that much slack you can pull on. So we're, I think we're at a point where uh, we really are running out of labor. And in your opinion, that's uh, what's driving inflation is, you know, demand is running up against supply. There's not enough workers to essentially meet the supply side demand. So prices are rising just due to lack of our productive capabilities. Yeah, I think so. I think that's, that's you know, you hear the Fed talk a lot about a labor shortage, wages being very high. Well, it's because we have a shortage of workers and not just in the U.S., uh, in many parts of the world as well, in the Eurozone, mm -hmm. for sure, in the UK, for sure, uh, less so in, let's say, Canada, but no, it, it, it's, uh, it's something that has to do with demographics. And so it's hitting every Western country uh, to some extent. Okay. And we had Eric Besmagian on the podcast last week, and we actually talked about demographics in the US and globally, and especially in Western developed economies. And it's really interesting because uh, you guys are both very intelligent uh, individuals, but he came at it from a different point of view where the demographic drag is actually going to be more so deflationary. But it sounds like you're coming to a different conclusion where the demographic drag could actually be inflationary because of excess demand and reduced supply capabilities. Well, I, I like to think of this with this thought experiment. Let's say everyone in the U.S. today retired. Okay, mm -hmm. so that means we don't work anymore. 
where do we get our money from? We have our savings. We have social security. So I continue to go to the restaurant or I go and I say I buy, I don't know, I, I go to bingo and, and buy some uh, cocktails and so forth. Who does all the work, right? So when you're mm -hmm. retired, you continue to consume. You don't just die. You don't, you, you don't work anymore, so you're not producing, but you continue to consume. And so I think there's that, from my perspective, there's a supply and demand imbalance. The Fed, like we mentioned previously, they have one lever to pull to try and get inflation down, and that's increasing interest rates. And they've gone on the fastest rate hiking cycle, I think, in history at this point. And inflation is still not at their 2% mandate. You hear lots of people talk about the leg effect where maybe we're technically only feeling two or three rate hikes in the economy today due to there being a 12 to 18 month lag from when they actually raise rates to when it filters its way through. So what do you think those conversations are like in the Fed right now as they're trying to slow down the economy to get that supply and demand in equilibrium, but it doesn't seem to be working as quickly as maybe they're hoping? So if you are a hawk on the Fed, what you're saying is that, you know, the lags, they're, they're a thing of the past. That's not really how the world works anymore. But if you're a dove, that is to say you want rates to be low, you, you, you'll talk about, you know, we, we'd hiked rates a year ago. It hasn't fully been felt. Now, the hawk argument, from my perspective, makes more sense. Now, the reason for this is because how monetary policy is conducted has changed a lot over the past few decades. During the time of Greenspan, who was Fed chair uh, in the 90s, you know, he'd hike rates and you actually wouldn't necessarily know that he hiked rates. Mm -hmm. There's no press conference. There's no announcement. It's just that the Fed met and maybe something happened. Today, it's really different. So today, if the Fed is thinking that they might hike rates, they'll be like, yeah, maybe I'll hike rates in the future. And of course, you have all these speeches, you have all these press conferences. So, so the point being is that months before the Fed actually hikes rates, the market already prices that in. And so that's already being felt uh, in, in the economy. That wasn't the case uh, uh, during the time of, uh, let's say, Greenspan and before. Mm -hmm. And so that fundamentally changes the speed in which monetary policy is transmitted. And so if you're thinking that there are lags, well, the lags have to be a lot shorter today than they were in the past. Okay. So um, my thought is that I think a lot of the tightening has not just already occurred, uh, but I think the economy is actually working through it uh, as in it's already worked past it. Uh, what I like to think of is, for example, mortgage rates. Mortgage rates, you know, we rose to like 7% last year, and then we actually came down to about 6%. Uh, so you can think of tightening happening and then easing. Now, more recently, it looks like it's gone back to about what the highs uh, it was last year. But I know obviously that happened really quickly. Uh, it's hard to say that there are, there are lags there. I mean, there could be in some segments of the economy, um, contracts renew more slowly. And so you don't really mm -hmm. feel that yet. Um, but, but overall, it, it's hard for me to say that there's a lot of, I'd say, tightening that's coming down the pipe since, since of the way financial markets are structured today. And I think part of the reason it's not working as well is simply, again, has to do with the structure of the economy. Uh, for example, back to mortgages, if you are someone who's a homeowner, for most people, you have a mortgage that's 30-year fixed. And for most people, it's below 4% because you refinanced back in 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. So you're hiking rates, but it doesn't really affect affect a lot of people, right? Because your mortgage is, is locked. And another way you can think about this is that let's say you're hiking rates, you would expect people to be affected by having lower asset prices in their stock portfolio. Uh, but it's also doesn't seem to be um, working that way either. So uh, I, I'm not quite sure what, what rate hikes are doing to the economy right now. You can make okay. an argument that the corporate sector, well, they're going to have to renew at higher interest rates and so forth. But but I think that actually misunderstands how the corporate sector looks today. The corporate sector is, um, you know, here's an interesting fact. The net interest rate payments made by the non-financial corporate sector uh, in the first quarter of this year actually decreased uh, compared to the quarter uh, before. Mm 
Now, how does it make sense for the Fed to hike to 5% and yet the corporate sector, non-financial corporate sector, actually pays less in interest pay payments? Uh, that's because they both owe money, but they both own assets that have interest income. And so all their short-term money market fund assets and their deposits at commercial banks, they reset higher and they receive higher interest rate income. But a lot of their debt, it's let's say five-year debt, that that's continues to be at very low interest rates. So corporate sector, you know, they borrowed a lot during when interest rates are low, haven't really had to renew. But even if they had to renew, their profits are basically around all-time highs, absolutely soared higher during the pandemic because of inflation, of course, inflation revenues. So they can afford higher interest rate costs. And the last point I would make is that structurally speaking, the U.S. economy, the corporations simply aren't as dependent upon uh, borrowed money as they were in the past because we're more service oriented now. If you wanted to build a big steel factory, a big ma manufacturing company, you need a lot of capital. You need to borrow a lot of money. Um, but if you're uh, building a software company or something like that, it, it's a lot more about salaries, about people uh, rather than, you know, borrowing money. So it's it's less interest rate sensitive today uh, as a whole than it was in the past. So uh, uh, from my perspective, I'm not sure that the rate hikes have had a very big impact on corporate America, at least not yet. Okay. And then with these rate hikes that have already been done, the consensus seems to be US recession, Q4, maybe early Q1 next year. What are your thoughts on the Fed really purposely trying to manufacture a recession to make sure that they get back to that 2% inflation target? Do you think they'll be able to? So the Fed can definitely um, get inflation back to 2% if it really wants. I mean, just do a thought exercise. Let's say they hike interest rates to 50%. What do you think would happen if interest rates went from 5% to 50%? So if you do that, obviously something will happen, right? The stock market mm -hmm. would have a bad day. A lot of people would, uh, would be... Um, you know, less wealthy. So they could do that if they want. The problem is, the question is always, what are the political costs to doing something like that? So as I read the politics today, people are very sensitive about job losses. People are very sensitive about unemployment. Um, people don't like recession. They never do. So I think that the public doesn't have a lot of appetite for the Fed to cause lots of unemployment. So if we do get a little bit of unemployment, I think the Fed, I think the Fed is probably going to relent and probably not really have the uh, determination to get inflation all the way back back to two percent, uh, because uh, the way you weigh the costs and benefits, it's not the political support isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, so I think it's a tough tough situation for them actually. Um, so far, it's been really easy because jobs continue to grow, um, but but eventually we'll, we'll get to a more difficult part. Another scenario that is also on my mind is that maybe even though perhaps the economy slows, the labor supply runs out even faster. And so you could have a situation where even though the economy slows, unemployment continues to stay low because of those demographic factors that we talked about earlier. So. Uh, you know, if that's the case, then I think they could definitely cause a recession and to get it, the economy back toward inflation back to 2% simply because the political costs will be so low, simply because there will be a very little unemployment. And is it fair to say that you believe the economy can handle higher rates um, as far as Fed funds rate at 5%? You think the economy is okay? Well, with we've that? At, we're at 5%. Everything seems to be going very well. So, um, I would not have expected the economy to handle 5% this well, if you asked me two years ago, um, but by all accounts, it's handling 5% just fine. What's even more interesting to me is that uh, the parts of the economy that are super interest rate sensitive, like housing, appear to have bottomed and are accelerating again. So we see housing starts surge higher. We see house prices gradually rise. So I think there's a lot more to uh, to the economy than, than interest rates. Obviously, if you're a corporation, you have labor costs, you have your expectations of demand, you have other material costs, you have regulatory concerns. You know, interest rate expense it's one thing, but it's one thing among many. I think it was. I think it's uh, very clearly wrong to attribute to give so much power to to just one variable. 
Interesting. And this is so fascinating. So there's two different uh, rabbit holes that I want to go down with you. The first one is, and keep in mind, I'm a bit of a layman. I, I don't work in finance or have an investment banking uh, background, but just looking objectively, um, interest rates went to 0% in the great financial crisis. And essentially they stayed there except for briefly in I think 2018 or 2019, where they tried to um, do some QT and then raise interest rates, but then it did throw the economy. Um, it was teetering on, on recession and then the COVID pandemic came and then we all know what happened after that. So my question is, do you think that the economy for the better half of 15 years didn't require zero interest rates and it was just grossly overstimulating asset prices in that case? So I think interest rate policy has a much bigger impact on financial assets than it does on the real economy. Like I mentioned before, if you're a person, if you're a business, so many variables go into how you conduct your affairs, where interest rate expense is just one of them. Um, I think we definitely... So I, 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 don't, I don't... So let's say the interest rates were not zero for the, for the, for the 15 years after, after the great financial... The 10 years after the great financial crisis, I mean they still have to have some number maybe they could be one or two percent um, i'm thinking that it probably wouldn't have a big impact would have would not have had a big impact on, on the real economy um, unless of course you you took it to like 10 you know, instead or something like that um, mm -hmm. but i think the side effect was of course asset inflation which created a, a lot of wealth inequality uh, which has political implications. You have all these this class of people, let's say billionaires and, and so forth, uh, or just rich people who are who are much richer than everyone else. And, and that's, I think that's that's something we have to think about as well when we when we think about um, a, a democracy. Is, is it good to have a whole lot of really poor people and a few people who are who are super rich? So uh, it could be that the inequality, the wealth inequality that this policy caused. Uh, offset any potential economic gains that that it created okay um, that's a really hard question to answer but uh, yeah but it's that, an interesting thought experiment where if we didn't have ZERP policy for you know close to 15 years what would the economy look like and would it be with the wealth gap would it be a little bit more um digestible instead of these huge disparities and in, uh individual net worth and stuff like that but on to a, another question here. What do you think about the weakness in the banking sector, especially regional banks? Uh, the KRE, the ETF for the regional banks, it looks like it's or it looks like that it's bouncing um, a little bit here. It might be kind of a dead cat bounce before the rollover. But I know you mentioned that there doesn't seem to be too much stress. But that ETF definitely got shellacked, uh, for lack of a better term. And the uh, what was it, the bank term funding program from the Federal Reserve? It looks like banks are still accessing that liquidity. So is there some things going on behind the scenes here that maybe just haven't made it to uh, Main Street yet? Um, I don't think so. I, so again, the stock price reflects a sentiment and many people are very negative on the banking sector. Uh, my sense in looking at social media is that many people have a very poor understanding of the banking sector. So... Mm -hmm. I would look at this problem in, through three different types of banks. You have at the top, you have the GSEBs, you have the uh, large regionals, and you have the thousands of smaller banks that no one has ever heard of. Uh, in the U.S., we have over 4,000 banks, uh, so eight GSEBs, uh, a smattering of super regionals, and everyone else is a small bank that you have never heard of. The small banks that you have never heard of, totally, totally fine. Um, Fed has a bunch of confidential data, looked at that. Small regional banks basically had no deposit outflows, uh, well, very little deposit outflows during March. The GSIBs had deposit inflows. And those regional banks like Silicon Valley Bank and so forth that we all know and heard of, uh, they had some outflows but have since moderated significantly. So when you're thinking about bank funding, uh, let's say, are people still pulling money out of banks? Uh, that doesn't really seem to be the case. Um, even if you look at money market funds, which some people are saying that People are taking money out of a bank and putting it in a money market fund for 5% or higher yields. Uh, that's actually basically been flat for, for, for a few, few, few weeks now. So, you know, that doesn't seem to be happening. Now, if you look at the asset side, if you're thinking about, let's say, rates are going higher, a lot of banks are looking at um, 
losses on their fixed income securities. Now, I think that really misunderstands how a bank works. Now, okay, let's 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 make this really simple. Let's suppose that I borrow money on an overnight basis and I buy a 10-year treasury security. Interest rates go higher. I have a loss on my 10-year treasury security. Um, oh no, that means the person who lent me money is worried that I might go bust. They're going to ask for their money back, which forces me to fire sell those treasury securities, realize a loss, and then go bust, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a common narrative. But let's say that I borrowed money at a 10-year span, and then I use it to buy a 10-year treasury security. Interest rates go higher, so I lose money on my 10-year security. The market value declines, but I also don't have to pay back my money until the 10-year treasury matures. So I hold it to maturity. Eventually, of course, because the U.S. Treasury has no credit risk, uh, the market value converges towards the part value. I get paid back in full, and I pay the, my investor back in full. Nothing happens. Everything's okay. Now, with those two scenarios in mind, let's say that a bank, I'm a depositor in a bank. A bank has a bunch of deposits, checking accounts, and so forth. Is a checking account an overnight loan to the bank, or is that a 10-year loan to the bank? Well, you know, in practice, no one goes to the bank every day to take out their money, right? That, that just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, you don't keep your money in the bank forever. So a deposit is a loan to a bank, but it's not an overnight loan. It's not a forever loan. It, it's somewhere in between. And so you don't really know just what the term of that loan is. And so when you're thinking about banks having losses on their fixed income portfolio, uh, you don't really know what their liabilities are. They don't actually have to go and suddenly meet redemptions every day. A bank does has a lot of actually levers to pull to make sure that their deposits are more like tenure money than overnight money. A uh, popular thing to do, of course, would be simply to be raise deposit rates, which they're doing. You can also do things like lock them into their ecosystem. Uh, let's say that you bank with Chase. Well, why don't you have a Chase credit card? Why don't you have a Chase mortgage? Why don't you have a Chase wealth management as well? You're locked into the ecosystem, just like someone locked into the Apple ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, what Silicon Valley Bank did was that they were like, hey, you are a startup. No one wants to lend you money. I will lend you money on one condition. I'm your bank, right? So that was a business model that uh, actually ended up not working as well as they thought. Um, yeah. But that doesn't mean that other banks will have the same problem. And indeed, so far, you know, it seems like they're all handling things all right. So I, I don't really worry about uh, the banking system. Um, one other thing that we should keep in mind is that people learn, right? You saw what happened in Silicon Valley Bank. Everyone looked at that and they're like, I don't want this to happen to me. So I, I better do something to protect mm -hmm. myself. And so that makes it less likely for something to happen in the future. Um, the last thing that I would talk about the banking sector is that it's often mentioned that there is some commercial real estate that the banks hold and that's it's gonna blow up and all the banking system is going to take big losses and so forth. I think that's actually a more, more, more of a real concern than anything like uh, unrealized losses on their securities. Um, so I, I would also note that in commercial real estate, you have very different kinds of commercial real estate. You have hospitals, you have warehouses, you have multifamily, and of course you have office space. Now the big problem thing in real estate, commercial real estate is the office space in big downtown areas like San Francisco, as well as the retail space that accompany that. Because if people aren't going to the office, they are not also not going to the local restaurants around that. Now the GSIBs basically have very little small exposure to that stuff, the um, you know downtown office and retail. The regional banks also have very small exposure to that stuff, but it's the thousands of small banks, which are together on aggregate ha have some meaningful exposure to that stuff. It's about $500 billion. So that's something to keep in mind of. Um, from what I understand, the exposure is broadly distributed. So it's not really gonna take any one bank down. And from what I hear as well, it seems like there's a movement towards uh, back to the office and so this whole issue about commercial real estate could simply evaporate. And if you had to make a decision, are you a buyer or a seller of the KRE? Uh, no, I'd, I'd buy it rather than sell it. I mean, I have no position in it and, and I'm not interested in buying it because I buy things when I feel like it's I don't know, go up or at least you have some dividends. And you know, I, don't think the, I don't think there's big trouble in the banking sector. 
but I also realize that many people think that there there is, and so mm-hmm. uh, the sentiment is not good. So I I don't think that it's just. Uh, I think it seems like it's just going to muddle around for a while. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure. Are you familiar with James Lavish? Have you heard about James and his debt spiral? No. Okay. So James has a really interesting thesis where he talks about the U.S. government debt spiral, where interest payments are now exceeding essentially taxpayer deposits. And now you need a deficit just to pay your interest expenses. And with interest rates staying so high, it puts the U.S. in this, what he's calling a debt spiral. Um, So based on our conversation so far, it sounds like you don't think we're going back to ZERP policy and we should get used to higher rates for a lot longer than we're all thinking. So my question is, how do you think that affects the funding of, you know, the United States plus all these other G7 economies that are also heavily indebted as well as the consumer having a quite a bit of debt themselves? Um, well, interest rates are one aspect again, uh, for example, so let's say interest rates are at five percent, but your wages are going up at five percent, right? So you have to keep that, and that matters as well. What if inflation is also five percent? Then maybe five percent interest rates don't sound as much. So uh, interest rates are, are not the only thing to think about. I'm not really worried about a debt spiral uh, because obviously, if you are, we're not on the gold standard anymore. Government mm-hmm. uh, uses a fiat system. If you have a fiat currency, you can never go broke. You can always just print more money. That is never going to be a problem. It could be a problem if you have inflation, which which is probably what, what will be more concerning. So what would happen is that you would basically just print more and more money to pay your interest rate payments and you'd have inflation go uh, higher, but you would never have a solvency issue because you can always just print print the money. Okay. Um, I think we're far away from that, actually. Well, okay, not far away from that. Maybe a few years from that. Um, so you're exactly right that the interest rate, the interest expense of the U.S. government is on an unsustainable path. Interest rates are going higher. The level of debt is very high. Um, but I, I think we're still, we're still some a few a few years before becoming just really really uh, uncontrollable. It's definitely on on the wrong path. Um, but I think it's something that that's not immediate right now. Um, should the time come when it becomes, you know, uncontrollable, what I think would happen is we would simply have some form of yield curve control, where the, basically the government sets a sets a limit for as to uh, how high interest rates can be, and we'll, yeah. we'll just have negative real rates for for a long time. Okay, and in your opinion, then, are central banks doing the right playbook, given? the state of the economy and then elevated inflation levels, are they doing what they should be doing or would you make any yeah, adjustments I think from your side? I think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. I think they're a bit slow though. Uh, I think the Fed is still a little bit behind. So, I mean, how do you know if your interest rates are, are high enough? Well, I think from my perspective, the first thing that you would see is you would you would expect interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy to slow. The second thing is you would expect the financial markets to react, right? So. We see interest rate sensitive segments of the economy like housing slowed last year, but then, you know, seems to be really reaccelerating. Uh, we see the financial markets, uh, you know, asset prices continue to grow. And that's that suggests to me that that monetary policy is, is not tight enough. Um, so if monetary policy is not tight enough, I, I think that inflation is probably going to remain higher and reaccelerate. Now, let's look at it from the financial market perspective. If you have stock prices very high, real estate prices very high, people continue to have a lot of wealth to spend. I can sell whatever I have in my trading account, uh, just go and buy more stuff, buy more stuff, more demand, and that keeps inflation high. And of course, if, if even housing is not being stopped, well, you know, you, you just can forget about other sectors as well. So I, I don't think interest rates are high enough. And uh, of course, we have this big demographic shift where we have fewer workers. I think that's a big, big issue that we've never seen before, because for all of history, we are a nation that continues to grow. I think it's going to be really interesting when that eventually shows up. And I think we're really close to that showing up where maybe unemployment continues to decline. We can create fewer and fewer jobs, but not because the economy is slowing, but perhaps because there are fewer people uh, who, who you can hire. Just a couple more questions here for you, Joseph. 
What do you think the future of central banking is? Is it gonna are mandates gonna expand across the board to include you know more social issues as well as their employment and inflation mandate? And also, do you think the introduction of CBDCs is a real thing to be concerned about? So I think the central banks have already been expanding their mandates beyond what they were originally chartered for. We have mm-hmm. obviously things like uh, the climate being most obvious. But you could easily see that being expanded in things like ESG and so forth. Hey, are you know are you hiring enough of the uh, you know certain demographics? Uh, if not, maybe if you are, maybe we will give you uh, you know lower interest rates or something like that. So in, in the eurozone, for example, if you are a green company, your financing costs are, are lower because the ECB is willing to buy your debt. So I think that that really is the trend to use central banks more of a uh, as more of a all of as part of a government's uh, social programs, and you see the potential for that in CBDCs, obviously. So, if you are a CBDC, um, the government can potentially program that money such that um, you can only use it in certain ways, or if you don't use it in the right way, maybe maybe it disappears. So, the the leader in the CBDC space seems to be China, which, as we know, is a you know kind of an authoritarian government. So CBDCs are most popular in countries where the government wants to have more control over the lives of its people. Uh, now, I think back to what happened a couple of years ago when we had protests in Ottawa, where we had truckers you know, who were unhappy with the Trudeau government protesting. And what the Trudeau government did was they basically you know, said, you know, we don't like you guys protesting, so we're going to freeze your bank accounts. Uh, that's mm-hmm. something that... Uh, you know, that shows that the government is, is willing to use these tools to get what it wants. And the CBDC would be an easier way for them to do that. Uh, in the U.S., I think we are not in the same situation as other countries, simply because we have more of a separation of powers. And we have uh, people who are a little bit more, uh, I guess, a culture that, that is a bit more individualistic. So we're not there yet. But we could easily be there uh, with some change in appointments in the future. What are your thoughts on just does the economy need central banks at this point, And is that going to be the way moving forward? So central banks evolved to solve a problem. And, you know, they kind of evolved independently in many countries across across different cultures, across time. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm inclined to think that they play a role here. I mean, it seems to be a common solution to a problem. Bank runs. Um, but I, I would also note to your point that in the beginning, the central bank, the Federal Reserve System was decentralized. You'd actually have different interest rates in different parts of, of the, the economy, right? We have FRB Chicago, we have FRB San Francisco and so forth. So they recognize that, you know, in each region, you have different economic conditions. And so some decentralization uh, allows the regional, the regional Federal Reserve Banks to better serve their region. Um, I, I do think decentralization... Uh, is is the future simply because um, we are not one size fits all. Part of the reason we have such discontent politically, such uh, I guess division, is because we're using there's only one federal government and we don't want one person, one one half of the country to enforce their will uh, on the other half. So a decentralized world is better because you have, uh, let's say people in California live their life according to what they want. People in New York, people in Texas live their life according to what they want. And you could make the same argument for the, um, for the financial system as well. Um, I think it might be more difficult to do that today simply because we are more connected. Like if interest rates were different in one part of the country, then, then another country, then another part then people would just go and, and borrow over there instead. Right. Uh, but I think the broader view of, of decentralization, uh, I think that that is the future simply because uh, it's the only way that, that will keep everyone happy. Yeah. And since you brought up decentralization, what are your overall thoughts on Bitcoin? And I'd love to get your thoughts on it in particular, having worked at the Federal Reserve and really knowing how the plumbing of the financial system works. Yeah. So my my strong sense is that the Fed really doesn't care about Bitcoin. Um, you know, Bitcoin is something that is uh, in the news a lot, but not a very big important part of the financial system. Um, what I've noticed over the past, let's say, few months is that there seems to be an effort by parts of the government to uh, you know, to not be as friendly to Bitcoin. And you see that uh, suit against uh, Coinbase. You see that, uh, let's say, 
Bitcoin ETFs are having trouble being approved. Now, one day the government w would like to have their own CBDC, I I'd imagine, and they probably don't want to have other digital currencies competing with them. I think it's very easy for the government to shut Bitcoin down or at least severely hinder its adoption. Let's just say that, you know, Bitcoin cannot be, uh, you know, just take off all the fiat ramps, right? It's, and then, you know, you would have to you'd severely hinder the, the use of, of Bitcoin. So um, I, I would not fight the government on, on this. Uh, they have a lot of levers to pull. And uh, if they wanted to, uh, to to make Bitcoin a lot less attractive, they could definitely do that. And that's done in, I'll say, China for as well, for example, and it uh, seems to have been effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. And since... A lot of the guests that we've had on the show have been actually on the, had an opposite perspective to you. Um, this conversation is oh, really great. fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to get your, you know, as a final question here, how are you positioned over the next, you know, few years to deal with an economy that has higher rates? And how are you looking to really generate investment returns for yourself? So now when you're thinking about how to approach the market, I, one way to, to begin is to think about what is the market positioned for? And my sense looking at the market is over the past several months, the market has been positioned for recession, for disinflation, for return to how the world worked uh, the 10 years before COVID. And so from their perspective, you know, buy bonds, buy big tech stocks, you know, Fed is gonna cut rates, we, we go back to, uh, you know, let's say low inflation, everything will be back to normal. Uh, my sense is that that's, as we've been discussing, is that that's not how what will happen. I believe that inflation will be persistently high. Uh, I believe that we are in a world because of fiscal spending, because of demographics, that the, the, that's going to be a problem. And so interest rates are going to go higher. They're going to stay higher for longer. Now, that has direct implications for asset prices because if interest rates are higher for longer, then and everyone is thinking that interest rates are, are going to go back to very low rates and buying stocks. Uh, that, that's a, you know, you, if, if what I'm saying is correct, the bond market would eventually price it out. And that, I think that'd be very negative to, to the stock market. So uh, I'm thinking that over the next coming weeks, maybe coming months, uh, we get more of a sense that inflation is going to be stickier than the market expects. We see that reaction in interest rates, 10 year going higher. Maybe the stock market um, takes a tumble. I think that that's what I'm looking for before I would be happy to, to be buying uh, risk assets. Yeah, that's that's how I look at the world for, for the coming, uh, I guess, for the balance of the year. Okay. And where can we send our audience? It's uh, mostly a Bitcoin audience over here, but where can we send them to uh, learn more about yourself? And uh, what oh you're doing? my gosh, if it's a Bitcoin, you should have told me. Now I'm going to get all the hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, so listen, if you are interested in learning about um, macro, my uh, thoughts and so forth, again, check out Central Banking 101. I have a website where I publish weekly commentary on my thoughts of on the financial markets and the financial system. You can check that out as well at FedGuy.com. Awesome. Well, Joseph, thanks so much for making time and uh, really appreciate you coming on the show here. All right. Thanks for having me.